We're going to move now, having done some preliminary work, to looking at some of the array of technologies that are available to study the brain. And we're going to distinguish between those that look at structure, those are anatomical studies, and physiology, those are ones that study the goings-on. Now, when it comes to the heart, for example, structure would refer to the four walls, the valves, the connections in and out, and so on. A physiological account of the heart then refers to its activity as a pump in maintaining the circulation. Now, it should be clear at this stage that structure is going to be easier to study than physiology, because physiology requires interpretation in terms of function. We've done a little work there to be careful. Looking first at, an, uh, at anatomy, there are many ways to do this. You can hang around in graveyards, steal corpses, or these days bodies are donated to medical science. And in this week's reading, there's an optional chance to view the dissection of a brain if you want to see what this magnificent piece of meat actually looks like. Um, brain anatomy is not well studied using x-rays. X-rays image dense, calcium-rich parts of the body, bones, in other words. Computer tomatography, however, is a different technology that gives us pictures a lot like x-rays. But the big star of the show here is magnetic resonance imaging, which you've probably heard of. And we're going to have a brief look at diffusion tension, tension imaging and diffusion spectrum imaging, which you've almost certainly never heard of. So let's start with this guy. This is the scanner, the magnetic resonance imaging scanner. It's a large, expensive device. It has clinical applications as well as research applications. It's used for diagnostic purposes. Many of you will have been in one of these. And if you have, you know that you lie on the beer there in front and are inserted into this tube, so it's not good for people with claustrophobia. And inside there, you have to stay very, very still. You're not allowed to move. As around you, Huge magnets rotate in that circular donut-shaped structure, making a lot of noise. It's a kind of uncomfortable place to be. The MRI, as we abbreviated, does not use X-rays. It uses very high-intensity magnetic fields to alter the spin of protons, and there's a lot of physics involved, and I'm going to explain this like this. It's magic. In point of fact, the physics and the physical modeling and the extraction of data from this is something of a dark art known to specialists. It is, introduces a great deal of technological complexity between the object being studied, the brain, and the image being generated. Um, so it's a complex form of measurement. And in any study using this, very few people will understand the pieces that go into making the image or depiction that results. Magnetic resonance imaging can image soft tissue and not just hard tissue, and it does so with great accuracy, great spatial accuracy. It can spot things that will uh, are smaller than a scale of a cubic millimeter. So very, very good spatial resolution. It's noisy, it's slow, but it's not invasive. It doesn't do any harm to be in here, apart from the psychological damage. And it produces images of structure. So this is what they look like. This here is a transverse section through the head. You're looking at the brain. You can see the eyeballs. When you acquire an image in this fashion, you actually acquire a volumetric image. So this is one slice through, and you can represent other slices through. And you can slice the brain this way or this way, or uh, this way. Um, so this is a slice like this, a transversal slice. Here is a sagittal slice, as if you were split down the middle. What can you see here? You can see the brain and you can see all the structures nestled within it. You can see the cerebellum hanging off the bottom like a little brain. You can see the brain stem leading down to the spinal cord. And you can see the nasal passages, the sinus cavities, because these machines are used for studying all parts of the body. You might have an MRI of your foot not just your brain. Here's the third one, the transversal section, or sorry, coronal section through the brain, and here you can see the, the fluid-filled cavities, the ventricles, in the middle of the brain. So these produce 
very, very good anatomical images. And what you find then is that different people have structurally quite different brains. The amount of correspondence between one brain and another um, at core scales is good, at fine scales is very bad. Um, each brain is different, just as each body is different. So MRI is a means of taking anatomical images. This is not the fMRI, which we will get to in the next video. As well as mapping the structures, there's been a great deal of interest more recently in mapping connections, connectivity. As we saw when we looked at the work of Warren McCullough, the way that individual units are connected greatly matters as to what we think they're doing. And we have discovered over the last 50 years or so that the brain is massively recurrently connected. Those circles that Warren McCullough was talking about are everywhere in the brain. It is pretty much a rule that if one area, area A, connects to area B, then area B connects back to area A, if not directly, then through one or two way stations. This ultimately has great consequences for the idealized model of the brain that emerged in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Most of the original artificial neural network models that were developed based on Warren McCullough's particular abstraction, were what we call feed-forward networks, and they assumed that you could follow sequ sequential stages. This idea still lives around, but it's become harder to support as we realize just how massively recurrently connected everything is. Now, the technologies used to follow these connections are relatively new. That's why you haven't heard of them, probably. Diffusion tensor imaging and more recently diffusion spectrum imaging allow us to trace the paths along individual axons, something that was impossible until quite recently. And they produce these kind of spectacular rainbow images. This in particular shows some of the connectivity in a marmoset brain. Now, given that we're talking about the anatomy of the brain, you might perhaps justifiably think that this had all been done in the 17th and 18th centuries because people had access to brains. But in fact, we're still making major anatomical discoveries. This kind of new technology that allows us to follow these long range connections makes something available to us that is not available to the surgeon with a scalpel. And so as recently as 2012, here's an example of a massively important anatomical structure found in the brain that was unknown before then. This arose through diffusion spectrum imaging, and it shows the existence of a fabric-like structure going extending through the whole cortex, from the front to the back. It looks like a fabric. You've got the warp and the weft, and it facilitates a lot, a lot of long-range connections in the human brain that were otherwise unknown. So this is a major anatomical discovery in 2012. There's still a lot to be found out about the very basic stuff. We'll move on to physiology in the next video.